everybody, uh, and thanks to everybody who's joining us in person and online tonight. Uh, as a reminder, public comment will be accepted in person only, and the replay will be available afterwards on Facebook, YouTube, and, and TV 36. Uh, adequate notice of this meeting, as required by the Open Public Meetings Act, was provided through the posting, mailing, and filing of the annual notice of regularly scheduled meetings of the Town Council on December 11, 2020. The notice was on that date, posted on the bulletin board in the municipal building, provided to the Westfield leader in the Star Ledger, and filed with the clerk of the Town of Westfield. Mrs. Rowley, may I have a roll call? Mayor Brindle? Here. Council members have good? Here. Parmalee? Here. Lagrippo? Katz? Here. Mackey? Here. Contract? Here. Dardia? Here. Boys? Here. Please rise for the invocation which will be given by Councilman Contract and then remain standing. Precious Lord, please give us guidance in this meeting because a lack of guidance causes a nation to fall, but victory is won through many advisors. Lord, let us not be misguided in this meeting so that we do not lead to decisions that produce ineffective results. I pray that you direct our steps so that this meeting can achieve our kingdom aims. We place you at the center of this. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The gym. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, some quick updates um, on a bunch of items. Uh, first of all, lead collection brochure is being finalized. It'll be mailed out, we hope, later this week, early next week. A um, couple of notes on the lead collection season. Uh, again, the center will open up um, for Monday through Friday, uh, starting October 25th, as it does during leave season. Uh, and starting October 21st, which is a Thursday, you can pick up your free leaf bags, as we did last year. Uh, and uh, so you can start you know, bagging leaves, so we encourage that. Main change this year in the leaf collection program is um, due to Hurricane Ida, we, you know, it just reinforces the fact of how bad keeping things in the street for long periods of time is, uh, clogging sewers, uh, you know, putting things uh, in the waters way along the gutter. Uh, so uh, we'll be actually, uh, the Public Works Committee has been discussing this for some time. We're actually gonna be doing this now in the brochure listing the zone that you're in and the week that, or weeks that you can put out leaves uh, for the two full pass pickups. So we try to limit the amount of time leaves are in the street. So for example, if I'm, in, I'm in zone five, for example. Um, I'll put my leaves out in the street the week before that, and then public works will come the week after and pick it up. So we're limiting the time leaves are in the street. Uh, it's gonna be a beginning of a process. It's a long learning curve, of course, but we're hoping to change the culture there and uh, help to get things out of the street. Uh, so then again, leap brochure coming um, probably by next week to all home homes and uh, collection will begin on November 1st and the first pass is usually a four week pass before Thanksgiving. Um, second thing is, uh, we talked about this for some time now, the center islands that we put in last year for St. Mark's and South Euclid, the temporary center islands where we were testing to see if that had any effect on traffic. Uh, it's had a very positive effect, speed, no accidents since we installed those. Uh, starting tomorrow morning, the um, uh, the, uh, well, the temporary islands were removed today uh, to make way for a contractor to come in to start putting the new permanent islands in starting tomorrow. And the temporary islands are gonna be moved later this week to another area we identified that we wanna have temporary islands tested on Boulevard at Grove. So uh, later this week, Public Works will install those and our contractor will be out at St. Mark's and Euclid tomorrow to begin the saw cutting and putting in Belgian block islands there permanently on that intersection. Um, also, uh, our rain garden in Tamaquas Park, that's, that's been done for some time. We had our last finishing piece uh, added last week. We had some uh, really nice signage done, very similar to what we did here in Minnewaskan Park some years ago, some educational signage about rain gardens, how they work, et cetera. So that was installed last week, and we're gonna try to arrange the ribbon cutting uh, now that the rain garden is completed. Again, thanks to the green team, Rutgers uh, Cooperative, as well as the uh, West High School track team who all contributed to that, and the many volunteers that got that done in public works, of course, as well. Um, also a reminder that tax bills were sent out, uh, so the uh, fourth quarter taxes were due on November 1st. We've had a lot of payments come in already, so thanks, thanks to all the residents who paid already. Uh, but uh, just a reminder, November 1st is the due date. Uh, and lastly, uh, paving, uh, since my last update here two weeks ago, 
not a lot has changed. We gave a lot of information last time about what's coming up. A couple of reminders. Uh, Elizabethtown Gas continues to do their work. They're trying to finish up some areas quickly so we can get <coughs> paving in in certain areas. For example, East Dudley, which has been a very long and uh, very uh, significant job. They're trying to finish up the last few home connections on East Dudley, and we're scheduled now, hopefully, to uh, have Elizabethtown Gas pave that road the week of November 1st, mill and pave. Uh, the entire stretch of Delhi between North Avenue and Mountain Avenue. In addition, um, uh, Willow Grove Road, which is our last job that we budgeted for this year, which is a state A job, is also scheduled to be paid the first week of November. First week of November is being chosen. That's a week where we have three half days of school and two days off, so we minimize disruption to the areas, especially on those two streets, which are adjacent to, to school, have a lot of school traffic on them. Uh, and we have other areas that are still being worked on for paving, but uh, a lot more to be uh, shared in two weeks at the next meeting once we have our engineer can get with Elizabethtown Gas to get more detailed information. But a lot of stuff going on. We'll be paving some roads, obviously, later this month and as well as uh, into November, as long as the weather holds. That's it. Great. Thank right. you, Jim. Um, thanks again to everybody who's watching and for those of you who are here this evening. Um, I want to begin to give an update on the Westfield Infrastructure Resiliency Committee that we announced a couple weeks ago. Uh, we had applications um, that came in and we did receive a number of impressive applications that re represent a diverse range of both personal and professional experience with flood related issues. And very grateful to the many residents who took the time to complete their submissions and acknowledge the time and willing to give the time that's necessary to do the work. Um, so tonight we are appointing eight resident representatives to add to the professionals um, on this team led by uh, Councilwoman Linda Hapgood and Councilman David Contract. Um, and so there'll be eight representatives, two from each ward, um, and whose perspectives will be extremely valuable to us as we undertake this effort to assess our town-wide stormwater infrastructure, and we're planning on making short and long-term recommendations. So these residents, who I were just notified this afternoon, so I hope it's not a surprise to anybody, in <laughs> um, from Ward 1, uh, David McAllister and Brad Nowak, from Ward 2, Steve Dombrowski and Rich Ellsworth, from Ward 3, Robin Browning and Susan Dynan. And Ward 4 is Adam Marsh and Georgia Marino. So um, I, they all were notified today. And for those of you uh, that who applied and weren't one of the eight, it, we hope will, that you will all serve as ambassadors to your neighborhoods. Um, and that's the other thing is just because these eight represent all, we do want to have council liaisons and ambassadors to the neighborhoods that were most have been most impacted by flooding from Ida and then on a regular basis. Um, this work is going to be no small task, um, and it's going to be uh, something that we think is going to be critical to the long-term resiliency of our town. So thank you, everyone who applied, and there'll be more to come. I think they're going to try and schedule the next meeting, first meeting in the next two weeks. Um, we had some great progress on public art the last two weeks. Did you notice anything new under the walls of the Central Avenue underpass? Um, the Central Avenue Mural Gallery was installed last week. Many thanks to Councilman Mackey here to really organize that on behalf of the Public Arts, Arts Commission and Adams Fest. And it showcased the work of local artists, and that's the beauty of it, is all done by local talent um, to really help reimagine the use as we bring public art to town. So one side is centered on the th theme of welcome, and side two honors Westfield native Charles Adams, and the work is incredible. So uh, there's going to be a ribbon cutting tomorrow uh, to publicly acknowledge the contribution of the artists to this special initiative. So thanks again to the Public Arts Commission and to Adams Fest for making it happen. Um, I just want to remind everybody there was a, a photo exhibit that the Public Arts Commission had just done through the lens next to the Rialto, um, and just, that was also local talent, and as it reaches its conclusion this week, prints will be on, on uh, for sale. So any, if you're interested, go to westfieldnj.gov slash public arts commission. All, all proceeds of any of this art go to the Public Arts Commission to support future art installation. So it's very self-perpetuating in terms of a benefit. I also want to remind everybody that tomorrow from 4 to 6, Union County is pulling up a, having a mobile COVID testing site for us. Um, it's going to be a and vaccination site. It's going to be on the South Avenue parking lot from, again, from 4 to 6. It's open to all county res uh, uh, residents for free testing and vaccinations. We are anticipating with the much uh, ex anticipated return of Char Charlie's Ale Garden on Saturday night. 
which is part of Adams Fest. We are encouraging um, everybody who will be attending to at least get tested, vaccinated or not, just to make sure that we can add this extra layer of protection to our community. The fact that 94% of adults in Westfield are vac is vaccinated is incredible, um, but we thought uh, it would be great if everybody will do that. So, and a reminder that Saturday's event does require either proof of vaccination or a negative test event. So please come, vaccinate or not, I will be there. Um, speaking of Adams Fest, have you seen and been downtown? Um, wicked windows throughout our downtown. Thank you, Councilor Mackey. My house is the paint depot, so I've, my dogs have been barking at many people who <laughs> have been coming up to my porch. Um, don't forget to cast your vote for Haunter House. Um, and again, uh, L Garden is for 21 and over, but there is a family fun day that is on Quimby this Sunday. Uh, upcoming lecture on October 20th, uh, the great art exhibit that's at the Rialto. Please go if you haven't been. Um, and there's going to be a, a Dudley's drive-in at the South Avenue station. Um, and be sure to follow Adams Fest. Do you have anything to add to that? Rocky Horror, October 22nd at the Rialto. And The Blob, the movie that really inspired the festival on the 29th. At the Rialto. At the Rialto. All right. So Follow if you're anxious along. to see a film in the Rialto, Now's your chance. Yeah. So follow adamsfest.com for updates. Nice. Um, <clears throat> also on a more serious topic, I'm sure many of you have seen um, a statement that Councilman Hapgood as chair of the Finance Policy Committee and Councilman Parmalee as chair of the Code Review and Town Property Committee issued in response to false claims made by the Westfield Senior Housing Center. We don't typically comment on pending litigation, uh, but we're really distraught by the, uh, by the dishonesty of the claims that's been made by the Westfield Senior Housing Center, and they think like, felt like very strongly that they needed to be addressed, both for the residents of the center and for our tax paying base at large. I do want to make it clear to the senior citizens who reside at the Westfield Senior Housing Center, and I've reached out to some directly who I know that live there, the building is not being converted into luxury condos in spite of what the false claims say. And we do remain committed to affording senior, senior housing in that location indefinitely. Um, as we mentioned in our statement, uh, the Westfield Senior Housing Center owes the town of Westfield at least $1.7 million, um, which is uh, something that acknowledged in their own audited financial statements. And we all know they have the ability to pay it. So we are well within our rights to be made financially whole prior to rene renewing any lease that does not expire until 2026. So I, um, I, this feels very personal to me because as many have, meant, have said, I have made an unprecedented focus on our seniors in with the support of this administration, um, evidenced in our lifelong Westfield initiative that we went out. Um, the very notion of these seniors uh, being unduly alarmed about their housing security is something I take very seriously. So we are not gonna allow this false narrative to stir up controversy nor alarm them. Um, and I just would encourage everyone involved to look at the facts. We've reviewed, we've posted all of the documents available on our website, including the audited statement, leases, financial agreement, and our mediation agreement. This is a, something that we've been trying to resolve for two years, um, all of which can be found at westfieldnj.gov slash Westfield Senior Housing Corporation. Um, another very important date today, it is the last day to register to vote, and it's not too late. You have till midnight tonight. You can register online. So call your college students. Um, and tell them they can do it online midnight tonight. Um, and it is really important to know what the options, voting options are this year because they're different. It seems like they've been changing, um, have lots of different options certainly in light of COVID. So uh, vote by mail, please. Um, I would encourage you to drop them in the secure lockbox at the, um, at the, uh, the county center um, as opposed to mail them, but mail is fine too, but drop them off. Um, early voting uh, starts October 23rd. The closest location for Westfield is Union County College, beginning October 23rd, where you could do uh, in-person machine voting. Um, and then, of course, your regular polling place will um, be available on Election Day, November 2nd. So again, full voting details are available at unioncountyvotes.com. So with that, uh, we can get to work on tonight's agenda. Um, before we get started, though, I do want Chief Adelora He's going to come up and provide an update on our crossing guards, um, and uh, I'll hand it over. Hand it over to you, Chief. Good evening, Mayor Council. I was uh, certainly hoping to stand before you with some better news this week, but uh, this has not been good for our crossing guard program this week. We've lost um, uh, another number of crossing guards, which is really putting us in a, in a dire situation here. Uh, just to give you some numbers, we're, we're 22 completed days of school this year. 
and on 69 occasions we've assigned police officers to cover crossing guard posts. Um, I spoke with our traffic safety sergeant earlier today. He already told us what our commitments are for the remainder of the week. Um, Wednesday we'll need at least six officers in the morning, six in the afternoon. Um, Thursday, four officers in the morning, seven in the afternoon to cover posts. Friday, uh, five in the morning and a, and a whopping eight in the afternoon. Um, you know, and that's before we get any unexpected sick outs. So, you know, we're talking 25 days into the school year and we will have committed police resources on over 100 occasions to cover crossing guard posts. Um, I looked at our, our CAD screen this afternoon from my office and to see seven officers simultaneously committed on school posts um, in addition to our regular call volume, and, and that's substantial. Uh, we're talking about a department that handles, on average, uh, over the last 10 years, 43,000 plus calls for service a year. To see this afternoon there wasn't a single police officer available at three o'clock in the afternoon uh, is extremely disconcerting. Um, these are the types of, of numbers that led us to look for solutions, led us to all city management services, um, and the numbers that I'm seeing here are even greater now uh, than what we saw when we were seeking out um, ACMS. I, I think we need to be realistic about our, our obligations and our expectations here, and that is I am hoping at some point in the 2021-2022 school year we will have a, a workforce, uh, for, for lack of a, a solvent work, one that can cover its commitments. Um, and right now we don't have that. We are not in a position to consider taking on uh, additional crossing guard posts. I'm satisfied with the posts that are covered, but this police department is making a very, very, very substantial commitment uh, to seeing that our obligations are met here, that the posts that we've committed to are in fact covered. Um, but I'm telling you, this department, uh, in the interest of public safety, cannot take on any more posts. Did, um, what, can you provide some context as the reason, like you said three just recently resigned? Like where, what is, what's so, the issue? So, you know, where obviously the, the workforce here has always been um, one that, that comes and goes. I will tell you um, it is primarily a senior citizen workforce. The, the average daily sick out rate um, you know, is somewhere between 50 and tw uh, 15 and 20 percent a day um, without a reserve pool of crossing guards. I mean we, we don't have full staffing as it is. Um, and then to factor in sick outs, um, you know, there's, there's a number of reasons. People have obtained full time employment. People decide this is no longer a job for them. Um, I've spoken to police chiefs in, in some of the smallest municipalities in Union County uh, and in some of the largest, and this seems to be uh, like any other industry, the food service industry, the bus driver industry, there's just a, a lack of, a, of, of an adequate workforce um, seeking to do this job. And, and until we, we are able to secure an adequate workforce, uh, this, I, I implore you not to take on any more um, you know, crossing guard posts. I think this entire program is going to need to be reevaluated. Um, and decisions are going to need to be made going forward. I, I think somewhere between 30 and 35 is an adequate number of crossing guards. I mean, I'm fully prepared to cover our commitments for this school year. Um, it's going to put a tremendous strain on the police department, and that in turn is going to have an impact on our ability to deliver, you know, effective and efficient public safety services. But we are not in a position to cover this number of posts on a daily basis. This is a tremendous strain in addition to our already substantial workload. And this is not a budget issue, just to be clear. Well, you know, I, I, reducing crossing guards was never a, a financial issue for me. I mean, if this governing body is willing to spend, you know, six, seven hundred thousand dollars on a crossing guard program, who am I to tell you no? This is this, this governing body makes those decisions. Um, this is a workforce decision. We simply don't have an adequate workforce to meet that type of, of demand. And um, you know, absent that workforce, we're going to need to scale it down so that we can co cover our commitments. Right now it's getting covered because we're making a very substantial um, you know, uh, commitment of police resources to it. But like I said, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon to have no police resources available uh, is, is concerning because if an emergency <coughs> were to happen, um, those officers are committed on school traffic posts and we're not going to abandon those posts because we've said they were necessary and we've committed resources to cover them. So, you know, it, it creates a, a very serious dilemma here. You know, I, I see the numbers going forward. As many as eight on Friday afternoon we're going to be covering, and, and we can simply not sustain that uh, for any, any duration of time. I mean, these numbers are, are more substantial now uh, than they were when we were looking at ACMS as a solution. So, Chief, one of the benefits of going to ACMS was that this was not supposed to happen. <clears throat> so well, I have two, I have two, two questions. 
One is what are they doing about it? Because we hired them to run the program and to provide sufficient staffing. So that's my first question. I guess my second question is to Jim, and he probably can anticipate it. What is the budgetary benefit, you know, or budgetary impact, I should say? You know, we're paying them to deliver a program, and they're not delivering it. So what is in our contract to make us whole as a, as a town? So just uh, I wanted to follow up. Thank you, Chief. A um, couple things. Um, first to answer your questions, last to first, uh, for any post they do not cover, we do not pay. Uh, but of course, pay them for having our own resources cover that post. Uh, two, um, uh, in reference to um, you know hiring, it, we're actually fortunate to have ACMS that is really trying, not only here, but across the country. Uh, they've actually we've spoken to them on multiple occasions. Uh, we're doing better here than they have been doing in other parts of the country on workforce issues. Um, but still, as the chief just alluded to, you know, directly uh, told you that we're still having workforce issues. This is not a Westfield thing. This is a national, national, national thing. Um, and not, not only getting the people to take the job, and by the way, we have a much better package than, commun than neighboring communities. Higher pay, uh, better, better uh, opportunities for the guards here, and yet it's still hard to recruit and retain. The retention thing has really become an issue. In the past, we had guards we had for, for years, uh, but the retention issue is a problem. One other thing about this program, and the chief alluded to it a bit, but I want to just expand upon it. Um, when we went to ACMS, one of the other things we decided we wanted to do was to reevaluate the whole program as it exists. We have what all what we call legacy posts, posts that have been in place for many, many years, uh, never really been truly examined, and we've added posts and taken posts away for the past 20 years. Uh, but the program has grown over time. Um, when we brought ACMS on, besides having someone relieving the police of that obligation of the human resource obligation, administration, et cetera, um, but also do professional training and something that they do for a living, we wanted to reevaluate the program. Well, we started with ACMS in the fall of 2019. We've never had a full school year <laughs> since they started. And so, as I alluded to two weeks ago in a meeting, when uh, there was a resident that came out asking about a certain uh, crossing guard post, and I said then, I'll say it again, that we want to reassess the entire program. We have to look at the entire program uh, for a bunch of reasons. We have legacy posts. Are they still the right posts to put in place? Number two, what is the current population of the schools? We know some information, uh, how many posts are required. But most importantly, what are the safe walking routes to each school, right? Just because people walk a certain way doesn't mean that's the safest route. doesn't mean that the route we should, apply, we should or should not apply crossing guards to. Convenient route versus safe route are really two different things. We discussed this with ACMS. And the chief and I have talked about this already. There are grants out there we can get through the Safe Routes to School program through, through New Jersey, where they'll do an assessment of the school population, the boundaries, the busing routes, et cetera, and they come back and they'll provide you independent data of what the safe walking route should be for each school. And then that's something you publish, the maps of every parent gets that. Right now, we've been putting out crossing guard posts, which is helpful, but, um, and people have been using those as best they can. Um, but again, it's, it's one of those things that um, we have to really look at, and hopefully this is a school year, starting you know, um, this school year we can assess it for the first time where we have a, everyone going to school for the first time. One other thing that was mentioned a few weeks ago I think is important to note. You don't really, uh, I know this might sound counterintuitive, but you don't necessarily assign guards based upon the number of students going to a school. If that was the case, we'd have almost probably 20 guards at the high school. You assign posts based upon the engineering and the location of the school and what is around the school. What are the closest intersections? What are the current walking habits? What are the current walking numbers of students? And so again, we have legacy posts that have been in place. Most of them are probably very good spots. Uh, if you remember two years ago, we didn't make some changes in posts. We saw that there were two posts on Mountain Avenue that were barely being used. We consolidated those posts, moved to one post, and said everybody on, that, on those that uses those two posts must now use this one. That seems to be working pretty well. So there are things you can do, um, but this really deserves a full analysis. But in the meantime, as the chief said, we are committed to the program we have. We deem the posts we have necessary. The police are going to do that. But as you've heard, ACMS is working hard. We're actually going to help them do some advertising this week uh, to get these posts filled. Uh, but it's, it's uh, a nationwide uh, struggle for getting and retaining a workforce of this type of seasonal slash part-time work. So anyway, thanks, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, so with that, um, let's see, we'll move on. And uh, we are, I'd like to propose uh, the following appointments to the Recreation Commission. Liz Chaco for an unexpired term ending December 31st, 2023. 
And Tim Simon is alternate number one for an unexpired term ending December 31st, 2022. May I have a motion to accept these appointments? So moved. Uh, motion by Councilman Mackey. Second? Second. Second. Second by Councilman Scott. 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 Sorry about that. Scott. Cats. <laughs> it's a mashup. All in favor? Yes. yes. Opposed? This motion is carried. Um, just want to check time. I do have a proclamation to read, but I'm going to wait till Kristen gets here. Um, Mrs. Rowley, do we have any advertised hearings? Yes, Mayor, there's one advertised hearing. It's for General Ordinance Number 2228, an ordinance to amend the Code of the Town of Westfield, Chapter 13. Anyone wishing to be heard on General Ordinance 2228, please come up to the microphone and state your name and address for the record. Seeing no one, Mayor may close the hearing. This hearing is closed. Councilman Dardia, please move for the adoption of General Ordinance Number 2228. Thank you, Mayor. I would like to move the, for the adoption of General Ordinance Number 2228 on second reading, an ordinance to amend the Code of the Town of Westfield, Chapter 13. May I have a second? Second. Second by Councilman <clears throat> Contract. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Councilwoman Habgood? Yes. Councilman Parmalee? Yes. Councilman Legrippo? Councilman Katz? Yes. Councilwoman Mackey? Yes. Councilman Contract? Yes. Councilman Dardia? Yes. Councilman Boyce? Yes. Mayor Brindle? Yes, this motion is carried. May I have a meeting to approve the minutes from the Town Council Conference Session, uh, Conference Meeting, Executive Session, and Regular Meeting of September 28, 2021? So moved. By Councilman Boyce. Second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Yes. yes. Aye. Opposed? This motion is carried. Mrs. Raleigh, do we have any petitions or communications? No, Mayor, we do not. Now it's time for open discussion by citizens. Anyone may come up to the microphone and speak to the council on any subject on which we have jurisdiction. Please state your name and address for the record and limit your comments to 10 minutes. Good evening, everybody. My name is Matthew Sheehy. I live at 143 Stanmore Place in Westfield. Uh, my family, my wife Joan, myself, and my children moved in in December of 1979. Uh, our years in town here have included a lot of volunteer work. I've been a member of the Board of Trustees, a volunteer member, of the Westfield Senior Citizen Housing Corporation since 1982. I was personally involved with the development of Building 2 and the programming of that building with the town council at that time. Uh, my children and myself and my wife have been in an, involved in a number of volunteer issues here in town as a family. Uh, I come tonight to present an appeal. And this is not only to the council, but it is to my fellow citizens and taxpayers. The town of Westfield has put profits over people by not renewing the lease for their affordable housing complex. This is an issue of social justice and equity for over 300 beloved seniors. Save Our Seniors Westfield is a growing bipartisan movement designed to bring awareness to the good work Westfield Senior Citizen Housing has been doing for over 45 years with volunteer trustees and the backing of the town. The campaign highlights our role as a national leader in affordable housing for senior citizens and or disabled citizens. As well as our desires to renew our lease with the town of Westfield and build 31 new units of affordable housing at no cost to the local taxpayers. Uh, this campaign, we are uh, sharing our connection also 
to the national affordable housing crisis and the local impact on our seniors. I would just di divert slightly that the growing need for senior housing is jumping every single day in the state of New Jersey particularly. Our board is comprised of volunteers, many of us are seniors ourselves, who reside in Westfield and or are experts in affordable housing, providing services for seniors and professional services uh, with our diverse backgrounds. Westfield Senior Citizen Housing was founded in 1976, a bipartisan group of town councils and volunteer trustees put this organization together. And since that time has developed and operated 303 units of affordable senior housing on town-owned land on Boynton Avenue. Of these, 130 units are being utilized by the town of Westfield to satisfy its state-mandated obligation to provide affording, affordable housing. The 303 units and the cost of their operations and upkeep have been fully funded by Westfield Senior and have not cost Westfield taxpayers a single cent. The mayor recently posted a missive on the town website where, among other things, she gave readers the impression that Westfield Senior has been avoiding rent payments to the town for many years. This is absolutely false. We have paid the town well over $2,500,000 since 2010. The mayor's missive was riddled with inaccuracies and half-truths. The town made an un unprecedented attack on the volunteer members of our community in stating some improprieties may surround the financial operations of our organization. Whether the council is aware, you get our audits every year and they're clean. And that's for over 40 years. In addition, it neglected to mention that she is aware that we are prepared to build 31 new units of affordable housing on Boynton campus, provided only that we receive a sublease, in effect, on the footprint of the Building 2 property, which has not occurred. The town's response is that we can have the renewal, but only on terms that are equivalent to the rents that would be paid by a provider of market rate housing. This is affordable, low income, and ultra low income people. Some of our low income, or I should say ultra low income people, have gross annual incomes of less than $9,000 a year. Ask yourself how they would pay market rate rent, including utilities, by the way. Our rent structure has that in it. Uh, this, is, this is why we are compelled to challenge in court. We are a 501c3 non-for-profit, and such rent levels are simply not appropriate for an organization receiving rents that require government subsidy to break even operationally. The town wants to convert federal and state subsidies from care of our seniors into the town budget. We cannot agree to that. By law, Westfield senior funds are federal money from HUD that may only be used for the purpose of our mission, senior housing. These monies are not to be diverted to a town. The town's statement deliberately misleads the reader to believe that we are not paying the town and are not providing proper financial statements 
when the exact opposite is the case. We have a nationally recognized accounting firm prepare our financial statements, which are then audited by an equivocally well-known and well-regarded firm, a firm, in fact, that the town uses. In addition, we are regularly audited by HUD and are in excellent standing year after year after year. In mediation, in, in mediation which we requested, rather than lower their demand for cash, the town actually increased the amount of cash required to settle the matter. Now they want five years worth of pilot paid up front so the town could receive it and spend it right away even if it meant millions less in future years of revenue. We are glad that the mayor has come back and said that the apartments will not be converted to market rate. Nonetheless, if we do not settle and receive lease renewal in a few years, the town of Westfield will be required to operate and maintain this senior housing. Currently, the Boynton site is being run by Westfield Senior Citizen Housing Corporation at no cost to the taxpayer. Uh, in the lease, is not, if the lease is not review, uh, renewed, Westfield taxpayers will be forced to absorb the operations and maintenance shortfalls uh, at a significant annual cost. She mentioned that she may get another company to run these units, but understated that would only be so that they would pay the town more money and that would be at the expense of services to our seniors. As a longtime resident of Westfield, I am deeply saddened by the display of social media sharing court documents, by the way, confidential court documents, and creating deliberate misinformation Mr. Shea, here, all at the you're, expense you're, of those in need. You're about out of time. Okay. And, I, and, uh, realize thank, that I just have. That, no, actually, I think you're out of time. Okay, not a thank problem. You. Thank you all very much for your time mm -hmm. and listening. Frank Arena, 507 Sea Oats Drive, Juneau Beach, Florida. Uh, some of you know me up there. Hello, everybody. Uh, but some of you may not know me. Uh, I was on a town council for 12 years here in Westfield. My term ended about two years ago. And like thousands of other people here in New Jersey, I've left the state and I'm now a Florida resident. Let me tell you, it's so nice not having to pay New Jersey state income taxes. Well, my uh, address is Florida. My is in Florida. I'm always going to have a place in my heart for Westfield, as you can imagine. And uh, all of us taxpayers know that we are amongst the highest uh, New Jersey, us people in New Jersey, the highest tax people in the country, maybe on the planet. And believe it or not, Governor Murphy publicly stated, I thought this was a joke at first, he publicly stated that if you don't like New Jersey's taxes, then I quote, we're probably not the right state for you. Unbelievable that he said that. Unbelievable. So again, no surprise that thousands are fleeing the state, uh, but what a shame. But I'm here tonight to talk about something else actually um, that I brought up at a previous town council meeting that I attended via Zoom a while back. And uh, let me first state that it was so good to see the Westfield Police Department under the leadership of Chief Battalaro being recognized by the State of New Jersey Police Chiefs Association for attaining state professional accreditation for the first time in town history. Congrats to you and your, uh, your team. Uh, you guys wear many hats as we heard today now the crossing guards, uh, unbelievable. With this in mind, um, I'm here again to ask what we can do, like other towns in New Jersey and around the country, to paint the blue line on some appropriate area. Just on a street here in town in Westfield. Why, what's the purpose to show our continued love and continued unwavering support for the Westfield Police 
They've been a foundational element for this great town for, for hundreds of years. This type of action would not be unprecedented. Uh, we've done something like this before. Um, and you know, if the mayor would support it, I think it could happen. <coughs> but let, let me recommend this, and this is also touched on. I've done some research, um, and I've seen that since mayor you've been elected, the number of committees you've assembled is up 50% from what it was. So how about engaging the community as you mentioned in many of your um, reasons for committees, and maybe we get a new committee, possibly named the Mayor's WPD Blue Line Advisory Committee, and uh, that's a possibility. Now, not being a resident of Westfield anymore, I, I can't sit on that committee, but I uh, have a lot of friends in Westfield I know who would eagerly join that committee um, if that were to be formed. So while I have you, let me you know, ask my former council members that I served with about my suggestion um, about a potential committee. And let me start with Councilman Habgood. If we were to form this committee or the mayor were, would you be willing to head up that committee? Councilman, you know, this, you know the protocol, right? This is a comment. This isn't back and forth. So, um, Would anybody so, be willing to support so, that as committee? As I said, make your comments and, and, uh, and we'll, okay. we I can forgot. address it's it as public years. comment. All right, so I'm sure that there's got to be somebody in the council who would be willing to head that committee. And in summary, you know, last time I brought it up, it was shot down. But a ha perhaps a committee you know, headed by, you know, we, had, we heard a couple of committees this meeting today talked about, and usually there's a council person in head of that, in head of that. And, you know, as you talk about, Mayor, the, the voice of the residents of Westfield, <laughs> let them get on a committee, hear this out, and I think it would be a great thing to do uh, for the Westfield Police Department, especially given all the many hats they have to wear continually. I thank you for your time and uh, be well, everybody. Thank you. <coughs> Can I move my mouth? Sure. Good evening, Greg Casco, 434 Everson Place. I don't know what we owe the good councilman for his appearance here tonight, all the way from Florida, but the only thing I can figure out is. It's silly season, and for those of you who might not be aware of what that is, when I stood here, when I stood here at this microphone during his tenure, he classified the time leading up to election as silly season. So I got home tonight, and sure enough, I had a flyer during silly season. And we're all met with how the current council is reshaping Westfield, which I just wanted to make a few comments on. Having been a 48-year resident here in Westfield, graduate of Westfield High School in 1983, Franklin School, Roosevelt, they talk about massive development in Westfield. If I'm not mistaken, a lot of this development going on was as a result of the council that sat here previously had to approve. So we're seeing what's happening now based on decisions that have been previously made. Increased traffic. During COVID, the South Avenue parking lot's been pretty much vacant. I mean, that's pretty busy in the morning. Late in the day when people are leaving. Traffic's always congested around schools because a lot of parents decide to drive their kids to school. So I don't know where the increased traffic is. I certainly haven't seen it. Overcrowded schools. Overcrowded schools perhaps because the state mandates classroom space for special ed and other instruction that we didn't see in the 80s and part of the 90s. I graduated from Westfield High School with well over 525 students in my graduating class. Classes before me were upwards of 600. We haven't seen those numbers in, in decades. And a failing downtown. I gotta be honest with you. I have spent more time downtown in the last four years based on programs that this town council has run, whether it be eating out on Quimby Street, eating at my favorite restaurants, which there are numerous. Yes, we all know that the, the shopping paradigm has changed. Our kids shop online, we shop online, but whenever I get a chance, yes, I do go downtown and I try to patronize the small shops that were here when I was growing up. 
like the music staff, the cheese shop, Woolworths. You can name a ton of them. So during silly season, we get stuff like this and understand that you have to take this with a grain of salt. Because I can honestly say as an avid council attendee over the last 10 years, 11 now, I haven't had to come up to the microphone as frequently. I haven't had to come up and communicate with my town council as often as I did before because they communicate with me. Whether it's my ward council representatives sending out emails, calling me. So the communication alone keeps us in tune of what's going on in Westfield. We didn't have that before, and that's why I came to the microphone, to find out what was going on. I thank you for your service. Keep up the good work. I support this town. I love this town. I still live in this town, despite my two daughters having graduated from college. And I'm not moving. I'm staying here because of what this town has to offer. Thankfully, for this town council and the way this town is being run. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. Good evening, Paul Cooper, 906 Irving Avenue, Manor Park section of Westfield. Uh, I was here to talk about crossing guards, which I thought would be the most controversial topic of the night. I was wrong. <laughs> but um, first, let me start and say, please, Chief, thank you. I mean, the information you shared, what you and your staff and your unit have done has been remarkable. And I, I think all of us really appreciate that. Um, I do have concerns, and none of them are directed at you or your staff. It's more of, of the state of the state we're in. So two things that surprised me that I heard last night. I was here two weeks ago. I thought there was going to be follow-up. You guys said you had my email, but no one reached out. Um, with more specifics. One is ACMS. I keep hearing ACMS can't hire. You hired them to recruit, hire, and maintain the crossing guard staff. It was voted on by this town council a few years ago. If you're going to sign a contract, you should have performance guarantees, you should have standards that they have to meet, and they should be paying the, the wages of our police officers who have to fill. So I'm hoping you guys are going to review that because this is a major failure for ACMS and something that's hurting us. The second thing that concerns me is that maybe we should do a review of all the current allocations. You guys removed 13 crossing guard spots two years ago. Wasn't there a review done then? And I know I heard about enrollment and things. This is why myself and other Manor Park residents are upset. All I can do is go on websites and look. The north side of town has four schools, 1,800 kids, and 20 crossing guards. The south side, seven schools, 4,400 kids, and 19 crossing guards. We had to beg to get the 19th. Okay, there's high school there. We have the town's high school, the town's kindergarten, and then we have Holy Trinity. Let's put them aside. The north side has still has four schools, 1,800 kids, 20 crossing guards. We have four schools, Edison, Tamaquis, Jefferson, and McKinley, 2,000 kids, 13 crossing guards. So if we can't hire and we can't staff, and I do not want police officers having to man it, why are we not looking at the current allocation immediately? You guys reduced the force two years ago, and now we want to review where they're located? Someone should explain to Manor Park why a school on the north side has a crossing guard on every corner. Four crossing guards around one school. Jefferson had one removed. We're down to two. Guess who has 150 more kids? Jefferson. So I'm surprised that I have to come back, right? I came last week asking us to hire more. I came back now and hearing what the police chief said last two weeks ago and today, we can't hire more. The ACMS better be paying us a whole lot of money to cover it. But you should be looking immediately how to reallocate resources because you're doing a disservice to a major part of your town that has Central Ave, Rawway Ave. These are the arteries of our town to get in and out. We have pictures of our kids walking with tractor trailers going down Central. If they're driving through other residential neighborhoods, please let me know. But it's Central Ave. So I'm kind of disgusted when we're saying we should really look at where we're allocating our resources. You guys reduced resources two or three years ago. Isn't that the time you should have looked at the allocation? Isn't that the time you should say elementary schools, by a criteria or requirement, should have a crossing guard on every corner? 
set baseline foundational criteria and apply it across the town so people like us don't think that Manor Park has to come here and beg for our kids' safety to cross Central Ave. It is crazy. So I appreciate the dialogue, and Police Chief, I hope you know, I appreciate you and the police force more than anything. This is not a reflection on them. This is a reflection on the town council, on AACMS, and it's embarrassing. We're taking turns as parents, walking our kids across Central Ave. I know there's a light there. Anyone who's ever crossed there, you have to wait for seconds and seconds because almost every other light, someone's jumping the light or going through the red. If anyone in this council believes a first and fifth grader can walk across Central Ave by themselves, you're a braver parent than me. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Hey, Jim, Wallace Hart, do you wanna address some of those things? I know you had mentioned some of the opening remarks, but maybe some of the comments about the um, the allocation and so forth. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, um, the current allocation uh, are mostly legacy posts. If you look at the elementary schools, um, the, and Mr. Colfer is correct, uh, you know, the South Side has the high school, uh, the Lincoln School, and the and Holy Trinity School. Um, taking those out of the mix for a moment, if you compare elementary schools to elementary schools, again, putting crossing guard at every corner does not necessarily make sense. There's, there's pieces uh, or there's three things that happen in this kind of thing education enforcement and engineering engineering is just really this part of it where uh, mckinley school doesn't need more than two crossing guards because of how it's situated tamaqua school for example doesn't need more than two crossing guards because of how it's situated this to one example um jefferson school is a larger property uh very similar to franklin school obviously that has similar franklin school is the biggest uh, elementary school but similar in size franklin school a little bigger uh, I believe there's, there's four crossing guards at Jefferson that support that school. There are five at Franklin. There's not a lot of discrepancy when it comes to each elementary school. The question is, where do you put them? And as Chief Battalora mentioned last week and two weeks before, two weeks ago and two weeks before that, um, when you look at where you put crossing guard posts, you're looking at what, what can take a place of a crossing guard. Um, and, and on Central Avenue, we have traffic lights. The Hawk light was installed for that reason you know, many years ago, the Central Avenue light. It's true that basically at traffic lights, people are not gonna obey all the rules all the time. Uh, I believe on, um, at the intersection of Central and Sycamore, like some other inter intersections around C Central Avenue, there are right-hand turn prohibitions at certain times, specifically designed during school times. That all being said, as we said two weeks ago, we're gonna look at this, we're gonna see, the town council has a right, I think there's a meeting tomorrow with uh, Councilman Dardia and members of his public safety committee and councilman contract about discussing um, some ideas of, of reallocation, other things, so we're trying to look at it, but as Chief Battalora said, we have a, a national staff shortage. We, it's very difficult for us to, to, to take a post that we deem to be necessary today and move posts when we actually have police covering them or don't have enough staff to do that right now. But we're looking at that, trying to get it done as fast as possible. In the meantime, we do have mechanized crossings all over town uh, that do work. Uh, and you know, New Jersey's law different than other states. When you uh, are looking at crossing a road, you must take the time to look both ways. I just came from Vermont this past week. The laws in other states are different. If you put your big toe even in the street, everyone's gotta to come to a screeching halt. That's not the law in New Jersey. New Jersey law, crosswalk laws are very different. And so when you look to cross the road, you have to look both ways, make sure the driver sees you at any intersection, mechanized or not. So they're all different rules. It's a lot to understand, but understand is Mr. Culpo's passion. He's, he's not wrong. And we're gonna look at it very hard to see what we can do. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. And Jeff, just real quick, uh, can you provide the details of that meeting tomorrow? Who coordinated? I understand that it just it's a it's a um, a meeting here at town hall. Yep. But yeah. So if you want to attend, councilman, you want to have it. Yeah, be nice, uh, Mike. Do, do you, can you tell me why you get an invitation? Or? Not send out an invitation, Councilman Lagrippa. Five thirty. Be there. Okay. Well, it would be nice to. Uh, know I'll about just it. say it. But so. Jim, uh, just real quick, the um, on Central and Sycamore, I went down there to pedestrian. Uh, when you hit the uh, crosswalk, that's not working. Uh, where, 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 what? On Central and Sycamore. What, what approach? The pedestrian on uh, closest to Tony Prieto. Okay, on the Sycamore side, Sycamore, yeah. uh, the Sycamore Field side on the house side of that. When you're crossing Central, so the okay. button doesn't uh, impact. Okay, the no, well, we can, we can uh, Chiefs here, you can contact General Electric, our company, and they go out there as soon as possible, yeah. Yeah, it'd be nice to have better communication in the future, Michael. I, I, I mean, 
Can, can, I, just, point, I, <clears throat> can I just address that, Mark? I, I requested the meeting. I've met with the Ward 3 residents. I, <clears throat> I went to that intersection and I specifically requested to talk about the allocations and about what we could do to improve crossing guard coverage on Central Avenue, recognizing, Chief, the staffing shortage. So I have some ideas that I want to share, which is the purpose of the meeting, which is potentially moving guards after the high school opens from the high school area to other parts of Ward 3 because I don't think there's as much foot traffic after the high school opens. So that's, that's the reason why I requested the meeting to talk about this because I, I, I know Mr. Callhofer, I know the entire Manor Park neighborhood. I've heard the concerns and I'm doing what I can, you know, within the, within the process that we have. Right. Now I'm getting the same request too, but I'm sorry, Michael, it's 5.30 tomorrow here? Yes. And we understand the dire situation with crossing guards, and we also understand how frightening it is as a parent to have your elementary kids walk across places that aren't safe. It's, you know, um, I, I do think it provides an opportunity to reevaluate everything. And I think to what Jim's point was before, we haven't really had a full year and a half of normal school. So I think it kind of happened concurrently when we were doing a new crossing guard program, so there hasn't been the the baseline, to your point, to really assess where the need is. But um, I think in light of what's happening with staffing, it's, 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 it, it's time that we have to look at it, and, and it holistically, which we were hoping originally that we would have more time to look at it as a baseline. So, But we hear you, just to know we hear you. Any other public comments? Good evening. My name's Terry Brennan. I live at 862 Rahway Avenue. Um, I'm here to talk about the town's proposal for the Edison, Edison's uh, Intermediate Schoolyard. Um, although I appreciate everybody's service here, I remain dumbfounded that my own Ward 4 representatives, both of whom I voted for, continue to support a plan that would permanently change the character, uh, character of our neighborhood. Our neighborhood already shoulders a burden for the entire town. It is regularly overrun with extreme traffic and con uh, congestion to accommodate football games, graduation ceremonies, band concerts, school plays, and regular drop-off and pick-up. In, um, in fact, on my way over here, there's something going on over there. It was hard to get out of my driveway, but I'm not complaining about that. Um, there have been crossing guards, um, if I'm not mistaken, and children hit by cars in recent years in front of Edison School due to the conditions we shoulder for the town regularly. We deal with daily noise from the marching band, which has interrupted many a conference call and baby's nap in my household alone. Other households also deal with unreasonable noise coming from Keller Field. Within the bounds of reason and safety, and those standards are often not met, we do not mind shouldering these burdens for the town. However, I think everyone in this room knows that if the Edison Sports Complex proposal is approved, this neighborhood will begin to border on close to unlivable. The noise and congestion will increase in severity and extend well into the evening. As much as the town claims that storm runoff won't worsen, um, and I believe they're sincere on that, and I'm sure they will get some a consultant to attest to that, I know it will worsen. The schoolyard for half of the school's children will be filled with the toxic and carcinogenic components that truck tires are made out of. They won't be exposed to this synthetic field once or twice a week for association soccer or lacrosse for a practice and a game maybe on the weekend. They'll be exposed to it every day. But I'm not here to talk about NIMBY concerns. Uh, the town's own research for the Parks and Recreation Master Plan showed that only 19 percent of Westfield residents want new artificial turf fields, and only 24% want sports, new sports field lighting. That same master plan studied the benchmark for comparable towns and showed that Westfield already has more artificial turf fields than the benchmark. 
I make frequent visits to various Board of Education owned fields near my house. There's several of them. Um, and it's a frequent occurrence that the field that I visit is not in use at the time by any team at all. This town has not studied what field capacity could be gained just by using the grass fields that we have. This town did not study what field capacity could be gained by upgrading our grass fields so they drain and so that they are durable. I love sports. I have coached in the Westfield Soccer Association. I love the game. I am 100% in favor of increasing field capacity in this town. When I coached, I know how often the fields over at Memorial Field had to go down because of rain. It wasn't right. They should drain. Um, but the proposed lighted synthetic sports complex at Edison School is the height of irresponsibility and it stands in stark contrast to the values that this town government regularly claims regarding maintaining the character of our neighborhoods, protecting our green spaces, and protecting the environment. Thank you very much. Good evening, my name is Bianca Wright and I live at 771 Lower Terrace and I'm also here to speak about the Edison Field. Um, I came here before and explained why I don't think that the current proposal is right and I'm not going to go into that again, it's for sustainability reasons, historic preservation. I would like to uh, um, iterate a little bit more what I mean by grass fields because I've reached out to several experts. Uh, we spoke to Rutgers, they have a plant biology department, they gave us some information. I um, spoke to a landscaper who maintains athletic fields with an organic land care management protocol and is successful with that. Through him I found an employee of a board of education here nearby. They have been maintaining their fields for five years organically. He shared with me that their coach, one of the coaches, just recently came up to him and said, the fields have never looked better. Um, I spoke to a volunteer resident in another town who is currently under a minimal budget trying to see what he can achieve by switching from conventional land care to organic man land care and he's seen a significant drop in crabgrass and it's making a huge change. Is the field ideal? No, because it didn't reconstruct it, but just that little change has an impact. So I'm advocating um, to have an expert come here. Um, to look at our fields, what could be done, because of course none of these people were willing to share with me over the phone what could be done, because that is not possible. Oh, oh I forgot one other person. I called the sportsplex in Maryland, that infamous sportsplex, with 21 turf grass fields and three turf fields. The grass fields are the ones that everybody wants to play on. The gra their grass fields have the same capacity as turf fields. So. Um, it can be done, it's just a matter of why, or how, rather. Um, it, the magic is in the construction, the magic is in the maintenance, in the drainage, in the right fertilization, best management practices, that is called. So I would hope that you will give this a chance, look into it, and speak to people who know more about this than I do, um, than, you know, all the knowledge that we've accumulated um, it's out there, and I would love to see that option considered, not only for the Edison field, but for all Board of Education fields, because I think this shared service agreement, Mayor Brindle, is a great start. We would have so many um, grass fields that we could improve and play on. So I would like to understand why this hasn't been done or why it can't be done, because I feel like there's an opportunity that would put Westfield on the map as a very green and sustainable town when it comes to youth sports. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. I'm Jeanette Spezio, 834 Cedar Terrace, Ward 1. Uh, the, I'm here to talk about the Edison Fields, which are not in my backyard. Um, many of you know I, um, as professionally, I have a small business. I am all about uh, sustainability and zero waste, which includes being basically against plastic. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about that for a moment. Um, plastic pollutes 
and it never goes away. All plastic ever produced since the dawn of time is still on this planet, in our land, our air, and our water. There is no ability for plastic to be composted or to disappear. We are um, in a situation where the plastic pollution is um, something we eat. For example, on a weekly basis, we all eat a credit card of plastic every week. Every six months, we eat this much plastic, just the bottle itself. So not the contents, but the bottle. And there are plenty of studies um, that are starting to show how dangerous um, plastics are to be ingested. And it's not just that it's a petroleum-based product, it's that it's full of chemicals that are hormone disruptors, estrogen mimickers, um, they affect our endocrine system, they have um, impacts on our reproductive health, they're carcinogenic, there's lots of stuff. And the most important thing to remember is there's no disclosure requirements on what's in plastic. And we're talking about putting in fields that could last between eight and 12 years, whatever that amount of time is. And at the end of that life, we're gonna have to get rid of those fields. So we're putting in something that we know is a pollutant it's little bits of plastic that get everywhere, and we wonder why it's in our food system. And it's just so unbelievably scary to me. In order to get rid of the amount of fields proposed, it's something like um, 130 cubic yard dumpsters of plastic. In 10 years, it might be really difficult to get rid of that environmental hazard. And we're asking that our kids play on these fields in the school and in their after-school activities every single day, potentially. It's just so scary to me. It's not, to me, a partisan issue. It's not a political issue. It's just one of public health. And while we might not have all the answers as to exactly what um, health hazards plastics cause, I just think that we need to be on the right end of this one and listen to the reports that are out there and be as careful as we can with the health of our children and um, the adults. And by the way, children have much higher rates of um, plastic ingestion than adults. Um, so that's another you know, reason that we should be concerned. So that's really what I wanted to say. I'm just concerned that we are putting in ginormous plastic fields when we could have a nice, healthy grass alternative. Um, and I just think Bianca made a good point about um, being able to manage them. So thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Thanks, Jeanette. <clears throat> that's what they all say. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> Phil Mirabelli, 1206 Boynton Avenue. I was here a couple weeks ago when we talked about Sycamore. I don't want to beat a dead horse here talking about the intersection. But uh, a couple things that I'm just, just concern, concerned about are, you know, when you talk about allocations throughout the town and what areas should be monitored with the crossing guard and which should not. And uh, when I think of Sycamore and Central, I, I think that should be one of a primary spot as opposed to a secondary spot. Um, I, I think within the, around uh, Jefferson, you got some guards in the area and in the neighborhoods. But th those are located around parents that have had their kids walk to school every day, or they are fully aware that there's a school in the area. On Central Avenue, as Mark and David told me, you got 10,000 cars traveling down that road every day, 30, coming 30, from the Garden State Parkway. And I can promise you, most of those people have no idea that there's a school a block away. Not a clue. All they care about is getting to work. When they see a yellow light, they speed up to make it because traffic is so bad lately. They're probably looking at their phone texting. As opposed to within the area confined around the school, you have people that are aware there's a school. They're aware that people are driving. Uh, excuse me, kids are walking, the people that are driving. Because their kids, once again, have been going and walking to the schools. Um, Nothing against you. you. You guys are doing a great job, and it's very unfortunate for what you're dealing with. Uh, I think you guys need to reassess the company that you hired. Um, I, for one, have never seen an advertisement ever for a crossing guard in the area. And I've asked everyone in my neighborhood, has anyone seen a crossing guard advertisement? And the answer is no. So is that a failure on the company? Is that a failure on the town? I don't know. I don't have the answer for that. 
um, an idea maybe. Maybe people don't want to be out in the cold crossing guards. Maybe do crossing guards for September to November. Offer that to somebody. And then again, April to June when it's warm, just as an idea. Um, and I promised my daughter I would read this to you tonight, Mayor. Uh, and then I will end with that. Dear Mayor Brindle. And how old is she? She's a fifth grader. She's 10. I'm a fifth grade girl that goes to Jefferson School, and I'm writing to you about the intersection of Central Avenue and Sycamore. I know that you may have gotten letters like this before, but I think this topic is very important. Me and my friends walk to, Sycamore, walk to school almost every day, sort of, by ourselves. We walk from school to the intersection, and then our parents cross us. The intersection is very dangerous, and that is why we meet our parents there. But if there was a crossing guard, we would walk by ourselves. I know that a lot of the kids in my school have to cross there as well, so I'm not alone. I also think we need a crossing guard there because I know lots of little kids that will deal with the same issue, too, when they are my age, and once I go to Edison, I will still have to cross there. This is why I am very much so hoping that one day soon that we will have a crossing guard there to help keep us safe. Please write me back, Mary L. Mirabelli, fifth grade. Uh, so say, can I have that? Is, her, is your address on there? And I know you guys are all like ladies. 1206 point. All, all are doing your jobs. You're trying your best. Um, I, you got to think outside the box on this one. It can make you a failure of the company you've hired. I mean, that's just the way it is. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good evening. Jan Onishi, 759 Millwood Terrace. The evening of September 20th was very exciting for the town's sports teams. The revised plan, they saw two multi-purpose athletic fields in the Edison Field Project. There were field lights, so evening practices and games can occur. Who wouldn't be excited for waiting for years for more field capacity? Mayor Brindle stated at the meeting that the Edison Field Project was never intended to be the only field. Other field development projects include the Elm Street Board of Education property and Memorial Park, and field lights are to be installed at Tamaklis Park. At the September 20th meeting, the financial information provided did not answer the Edison's neighbors' questions and concerns. The Edison project is expected to cost $9 million, plus millions more in ongoing maintenance and synthetic turf replacement costs over the life of the field installation. We were told that the town will bear the, bear the full debt service. Bonds will be issued. Projected pilot payments from the Westfield Crossing development on South Avenue will be used to pay the debt. What happens if the development fails to achieve projected occupancy rates? What if the construction is delayed? What is the town's contingency plan to repay the debt if the pilot payments do not materialize? How is the development of two more sites and the addition of field lights in Tamaklis Park to be funded? Are these funded using the same pilot funding as the Edison Field Project, or are different funding mechanisms proposed or being thought of? If so, what are they? With development of more athletic fields in town, it is obvious that more resources will be need needed to maintain the fields. We hope to have discussions to compare the pros and cons of artificial and natural grass turf fields, including cost differences. No matter what kind of turf is used, maintenance will be needed. What are the plans to provide resources to parks and recreation? In the Parks and Recreation Master Plan, it states that tax, tax dollars will no longer be sufficient to maintain the parks. New funding sources are needed to financially support the parks. Excuse me. And recreation. Suggested funding streams include donations, grants, foundations, contributions from sports leagues, and developing ways to create revenue. The plan describes ways to collect revenue for the town, including what looks to be events on athletica fields. Is this the plan? If so, there is a large reliance on soft money to fund a very important function in town. That's the Department of Public Works. Alternatively, will tax dollars within the tax budget be shifted to properly maintain the new fields, or will new taxes be needed as field capacity is increased? We need another meet town meeting, Mayor Brendel. 
You need to explain how you plan to finance both construction and maintenance of the field's projects. We also do not understand why the cost of two full-sized artificial turf fields with lights and restroom facilities in the Parks and Recreation Plan costs three and a half million dollars, while the same scope now costs nine million in the revised plan. Although the public does not have a vote on these pro projects, we, the citizens, have the right to understand the details of the financial commitments you are making for us. When can you schedule a virtual or in-person meeting with us and explain the financial plans to build and maintain the new fields in the Westfield? I'll wait till after the meeting to talk with you, Mayor Brindle, and hopefully we can find a way that we can have a, another conversation with the uh, community. Thank and I you. thank, thank uh, Town Council. Thanks. Zoe McKelvey, um, 320 Harrison Avenue. Um, I, I just have a few additional comments about the Edison Field Project plan. Um, I don't live nearby, so I thought maybe I could not be <laughs> accused of nimbyism. Um, I just want to read one quote. Um, this is on the Safe Healthy Playing Field site, which is a organization that is non a volunteer organization it's not <coughs> funded by anyone that I could figure out um, by the end of 2018 at least a hundred million pounds of plastic and tire waste I forgot my glasses over there <laughs> will have entered air water and landfills from disposal of s synthetic turf fields let me just grab my glasses sorry <laughs> An equivalent amount of petroleum-based plastic will be used to create new fields. Children face unique risks from toxins, heat, hardness and abrasions playing on plastic fields with any kind of infill, or playgrounds made from tires. Injury is one major risk, and you can see a lot of sources for this. Um, there's also been lead found in the infill um, crumb rubber, um, and that was an issue in a Newark um, I think it was an artificial turf in Newark and one in Washington, D.C. And this is slightly stale, so there's been more discussion since then. Um, what I just wanted to make clear was that I had not realized that financially natural grass was also potentially better. Environmentally, obviously, and public health, that jury's still out on that. The studies are ongoing with the EPA, so we can't say for sure, but we know that there are toxic chemicals that run off and that do get in people's skin and potentially get inhaled and um, get tracked around um, and in the water system. So I, I was looking at the um, Master Parks Plan 2019 final version and a lot of people seem to feel that the holes in our grass fields and the, the risk of injury in our grass fields had to be solved with artificial turf, and I just want to make sure, I think you've heard it before, but reiterate that I don't think that's the case. I think that, as Bianca and others have, have discussed other times and tonight, if one consults with an expert um, on grass field maintenance and gets a cost estimate, we can really get a better sense of whether it might even be cheaper to go with a grass field uh, upgrade as opposed to taking away the grass and adding foam, I mean not foam, crumb rubber or plastic as parts of it are. Um, one other thing I thought was interesting, um, there are a lot of organizations I'm sure, uh, I'm happy to provide any of these um, materials to you if you want, but I mean I won't reiterate the Mount Sinai doctor's concerns about the, the jury being out on the health effects on children playing on these fields and athletes. Um, but I just thought it was interesting, even the FIFA, you know, women's soccer is not going to be held in 2023 on the, um, on any artificial turf because the soccer players themselves don't prefer it. And I don't think it's necessary to spend an inordinate amount of money to get to the level where the grass fields are playable. And I, you know, I'm not saying, I think an expert, as Bianca said, is necessary to, to consult. And I'm not sure if that's been done. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't mean, you know, anyone's at fault. I just I would love to hear more about a cost-benefit analysis with um, 
a grass fields expert. And I have, you know, there's a Cornell one, there's a Rutgers one, there's a lot of these um, safe, healthy playing fields points to a lot of resources for sports, specifically sports field maintenance that doesn't have to break, break the bank. <laughs> so thank you so much uh, for all your hard work on this. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jerome Fader. I live at 789 Knollwood Terrace. Uh, I'm here to also talk about the Edison Sports Field, but with a much narrower focus than some of the uh, previ previous speakers. Um, I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to focus in on the lighting, because I believe it's what's going on is there's a, a, a sales job that is, this lighting has much less impact than it really it, it, it would, would have. Um, the, the picture that I just handed out is a, uh, a, a diagram produced by Spiesel, the consul consult that's the revised proposal uh, for, from September 20th for the 250,000 square turf field. Uh, I guess one of the things is that the new field tries to cram a lot of stuff into a, a very small space. Uh, in looking at the diagram that you have, the edge of the green area on the, broad of, on the bottom, separating it from the blue, shows little dots connected uh, connected by a line, and that's basically the chain link fence that uh, surrounds the field, and that represents essentially the property boundary, or the boundary of the Board of Education property. Um, the green area represents the field, um, and the field, in some areas, this, that green area goes up right up to the property boundary. Other cases, there is some space. Um, the, um, a key point is on the other side of that property boundary. There are houses, there are some as close as 15 feet from the boundary, and, uh, and that would be very close to anything that's done on the field. Um, the, uh, one of the things that I wanted to, uh, especially to point out, uh, there's a house, it, it, probably more than one house, that um, is, clo is uh, close to the property boundary and with a bedroom window that's about 15 feet from it, and, uh, and if you actually look at there's a one of the lights is about you know, 15 feet uh, from that property boundary, and there's an autistic child that's, that lives in that bedroom. And basically, this plan puts a stadium light very close to a child's bedroom window. So that's one. Um, I've uh, I've been looking at the. Uh, I guess there's this sort of. Uh, point of view that's being put forward that these are LED lights and they're somehow they're magical and they don't, they're not going to bother people and because they're not like the old lights. So I started looking in to what do these lights really produce and, uh, and it's still a work in progress because it's hard to get data from the manufacturers on how much, they'll tell you what uh, about this, the light that falls on the field but they, they're very reluctant to tell you how much stray light falls, which is one of the things that we're interested in, how much light is going to be received by the people um, who are uh, basically on the outside of the field who just want to live their lives. And so uh, I, I started to look at um, how bright are the new lights? And it's, 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 it's not easy to find out. What Westfield has some rules. It requires that light spillage onto neighboring process, properties be less than 0.3 foot can candle. That's a technical description of, of light quantity. Um, I did see one manufacturer's installation instruction, which said that when you're installing uh, field lights, uh, avoid situations where you're, you're actually uh, think you're going to get more than one foot candle, which is uh, you know much more. In other words, essentially t avoid that, and it's likely to be expensive and hard to meet. Um, I also found that the town of Eatontown, which has spent a fair amount of time on this and has a model law ordinance with respect to lighting, has a, a 0.1 foot candle uh, light limit, and they're, I guess they, they're kind of urging or encouraging other people to adopt their ordinance. And that's, uh, so I'm kind of concerned that uh, 
we have a manufacturer saying uh, one foot candle and we have the town of Eatontown talking about a standard that's uh, much uh, stricter. And I, I guess I'm very much be interested if there, if, if you folks know of a place where I can see demonstrations of the new technology not lighting uh, that, that is non-obtrusive, because I'd like to go there and measure it. And, uh, I guess, and basically, I guess I would like to just in, in, insert some reason and sanity into all of this. Uh, so in summary, uh, I don't believe that this is a good place to be expanding a, a ball field uh, uh, one, for one reason, because of the houses nearby in close proximity. Uh, I urge, uh, urge you to see, uh, consider the search for other better alternatives, uh, hopefully alternatives that don't ne necessarily need lighting or not near places where they would bother people. And thank you for listening. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Hearing none, I uh, close this portion of the meeting. Um, typically, I, we have people address comments. I think I saw, um, looks like many of them left. Uh, 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 um, Tom, I don't know whether we should address any of Mr. Sheehy's comments on senior housing. It's typically, you don't litigate that stuff in a council meeting. No comment. So. Uh, uh, no comment on that. I think we stand by our statement that we issued the other day. Um, and I see former Councilman Arena left about the committee. We'll take that under advisement. We'll certainly talk to the chief about it if he finds that's something they would want. Um, but I have to say, I think the best way that we can support the police is make sure that they're fully funded and staffed. Um, and this administration re has restored all the funding and staffing levels to the highest levels they've been. Um, so. Very happy about that, but certainly to entertain other, other levels of support that you feel like you may need. Um, thank you, Mr. Casco. He's gone too for his comments. Um, and the crossing guard, I think we hopefully addressed some of that. Um, I, I, I just want to make sure that these residents know that they've been heard. Uh, clearly, I think um, with challenges come opportunity, and I think it is, it is time to reevaluate the entire. Um, uh, crossing guard program. And I do want to say a little bit in defense of ACMS um, because I don't think what people realize is, um, and they haven't seen an ad, well, I can tell you what, when our police department was running the program, you, uh, ACMS is doing, with all due respect, chief, is doing a heck of a lot better job on advertising for positions than what the police chief, uh, but the police was enabled to do. I mean, you guys were running as an HR department, which isn't really a core competency of our, of our police department. So. Um, I, I clearly, obviously, there's a much larger issue here at work unrelated to one, um, one company, and I think we're just going to have to revisit how we're addressing our crossing guard programs in light of that. Um, and then regarding all of you folks from, that have come and talked about the Edison fields, um, as, we, as you know, these are ongoing conversations. I know, I, I know, Councilman, you had a meeting recently, right? Uh, yeah, actually, Bianca was uh, as part of the neighborhood uh, advisory group. We had our third meeting. Um, we're sort of processing some of the information. They sent an email recap from it, and we have another one set for uh, the second week in November. Oh, good. So, I mean, uh, and then there's some other information coming. So, um, so uh, obviously, we're, just, we're still listening, we're still learning, and there's no action being taken um, without getting additional information, I know, from the parking assessment and so forth. So, um, I think I covered all of that. So, um, so thank you all for um, coming. And I don't know, um, Jim, is Kristen here? From, oh, there you are. I was like, sorry, come on up. We do have, um, apologies, you've been back there. So we do have a proclamation. And Kristen, was it back to school night, right, before? No, I just wanted to Oh, no, we're not because of Jim. Uh, so, uh, so thank you for coming. Observation of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So again, you can take this off of the pictures and so forth. Um, whereas October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, let it be known that the town of Westfield is pleased to recognize and observe October 13, 2021 as Metastatic Breast Cancer Awareness Day and hereby recognize the Light Up NBC, uh, Light Up NBC National Campaign, which I'm going to have you talk about in a minute. Okay. Um, whereas 
Breast cancer is the most common type of cancer among women in the world and second leading cause of cancer death among women in the U.S. More than one in eight women and one in 833 men in the U.S. will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. In 2021, an estimated 284,200 Americans will be diagnosed with invasive breast cancer, including over 8,330 women in New Jersey. Whereas metastatic breast cancer occurs when breast cancer spreads to other parts of the body, including the bones, lungs, liver, and brain has an average life expectancy of 26 months. Regardless of early detection, detection approximately 30% of stage zero to three breast cancers will return in stage four. An estimated 44,130 Americans, including 1,250 New Jerseyans, will die from breast cancer in 2021, equal to 115 women and men per day, which is unbelievable, with 98% due to metastatic breast cancer. And whereas the national organization Metavivor Research and Support runs critical stage four metastatic breast cancer research, educates the public about metastatic breast cancer and lack of funding for stage four treatment. They aim to dramatically increase the current percentage of U.S. breast cancer research dollars from the 5% to 30% for the already metastasized patient. The national hashtag for this initiative on social media follow on the Donor Ignore Stage 4 and Light Up NBC. Whereas there's a national Light Up NBC campaign on October 13th every year to illuminate 115 landmarks in the metastatic colors of teal, <coughs> pink, and green throughout the world bringing awareness to the disease and to honor the daily number of lives lost to MBC. Whereas the pink ribbon is well known for representing the fight against early stage grants for breast cancer, it is not inclusive of stage four. Therefore, the metastatic breast cancer awareness tricolor tri ribbon, sorry, I didn't know how to get that at home, um, includes teal, pink, and green. The teal color portrays healing and spirit spirituality. Green represents the triumph of spring over winter, life over death, renewal of hope and immortality, and the thin pink overlay signifies that the cancer originated in the breast. Whereas metastatic breast cancer affects all races and socioeconomic classes. While Caucasian women are see, see slightly higher incidence rates of breast cancer, the mortality rate for black women is 41% higher than that of Caucasian women, and breast cancer is a leading cause of cancer-related death for Hispanic women. Now therefore be it proclaimed that I, Shelley Brindle, mayor of the town of Westfield, hereby encourages citizens to join the national effort towards awareness of metastatic breast cancer during October through Metavivor. Be it further proclaimed that the month of May, 2021, be designated as <laughs> tomorrow, that's next time. So thank you for being here tonight. And maybe you could tell everybody a little bit about it and know your story too. That would be great. Um, I'm really proud of you. Website Thank again. you. Can we get a picture of someone here? Someone oh, there you are. Here he is. Here I was looking right. for her. Thank you. Great. Thank you for being here. Okay, so uh, we are moving on to bills and claims. Council and Hapgood. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to move bills and claims in the amount of $430,467.37. May I have a second? Second. Any uh, second by Council Legrippo? Any discussion? All in favor? Yes. yes. Opposed? Uh, this motion is carried. Uh, next on the agenda is reports of standing committees, finance policy committee, Council and Hapgood. Thank you again, Mayor. I have 12 resolutions that I'd like to move as a package. The first, a resolution authorizing the CFO to draw a warrant for dog licenses for September 2021. 
The second, a resolution authorizing the CFO to refund recreation department fees. The third, a resolution authorizing the CFO to draw a warrant to refund street opening cash bond. The fourth, a resolution authorizing the CFO to draw warrants for 2019 pursuant to Tax Court of New Jersey. Number five, a res resolution authorizing the CFO to draw a warrant for third quarter construction officials state permit fees for 2021. Six, a resolution authorizing the CFO to draw a warrant to treasure state of New Jersey for marriage slash civil union license fees. And then I have five resolutions that I will go through individually, but I would just like to say that these are all insertion of special item of revenues, which means that we are getting grant money in all of these categories, which is exciting. <clears throat> so the seventh is a resolution to approve insertion of special item of revenue in the municipal budget for our clean communities grant. Number eight, a resolution to approve insertion of special item of revenue in the municipal budget for public health capacity. Number nine, a resolution to approve insertion of a special item of revenue in the municipal budget for the municipal alliance. Number 10, a resolution to approve insertion of special item of revenue in the municipal budget national priority safety programs. And the 11th, a resolution to approve insertion of special item of revenue in the municipal budget for sustainable Jersey. The last is a resolution establishing a custodian for the Westville Memorial Library Petty Cash Fund. May I have a second? Second. Uh, so my Councilman Mackey, any discussion? All in favor? Yes. 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 Opposed? This motion is carried. Um, and with that, any other final comments before we adjourn? All right, we have a motion to adjourn. So moved. By Councilman Mackey, second? Second. Second, second by Councilman Dardia. All in favor? Yes. Yes. Opposed? Yes. This motion is carried and this meeting is adjourned.